Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the fourth keynote session of the 21st Southeast Asian Geotechnical Conference and fourth AGSSEA conference, which of course will be delivered by Professor Putema Indaratana. It is my honor to introduce him to you all. Currently, Professor Putima Indaratana is a distinguished professor of civil engineering and the director of Transport Research Center at University of Technology, Sydney. He's also an honorary distinguished professor at the Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand, Indian Institute of Technology in Assam, and Harbin Institute of Technology in Harbin, China. Professor Putima is a civil engineering graduate from Imperial College, London, since his PhD at University of Alberta in Canada in 1987, his contributions to geotechnical and railway engineering have been acknowledged through numerous national and international awards, including first Ralph Proctor Lecture and, first, uh, and, sorry, and fourth Louis Menach Lecture of the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. He also delivered the 2009 E.H. Davis Memorial Lecture of the Australian Geomechanics Society for contributions to theory and practice of geomechanics. And the 2022 Stephen Marich Lecture on Advances in Railroad Engineering. For his pioneering contributions, he was honored with the 2009 Business and Higher Education Award by the Australian Commonwealth 2011 Engineers, Australia Transport Medal, and 2015 Australia New Zealand Railway Technical Society Outstanding Individual Award. Other numerous international awards include Thomas Telford Premium by the Institution of Civil Engineers UK thrice the recipient of Robert Quickly Commendation Awards by the Canadian Geotechnical Society and the Medal of Excellence for Lifetime Contribution by the International Association of Computer Methods and Advances in Geomechanics. And just a couple of weeks ago, he received the prestigious award for the most outstanding contribution to civil engineering from the Institution of Civil Engineers London. So our heartfelt congratulations to Professor Butima on that. And I think as far as I know, he would also touch upon on that subject in today's lecture as well. So please join me in welcoming Professor Butima to deliver his keynote. Thank you very much, Dr. Apinit, for that kind and somewhat lengthy introduction and it's an absolute honor and privilege to be here. I know it's always difficult to give a lecture and to listen to one immediately after a heavy lunch, but uh, I think we can all do the best we can. Um, I'm going to talk about a very different topic. I mean, when I was invited for this, I made sure that it's got to be applicable for the audience here. And I'm going to talk about a topic which is called mud pumping. You will see that in countries like Australia, China, I'm not too sure about Thailand, but in Southeast Asian countries, in certain parts, and certain parts of Eastern Canada, when the railways have suddenly increased their axle loads, the lengths of the trains and the speeds of the trains, soil that have been stable for millions of years suddenly become a liquid, just like liquefaction under earthquakes and pumps up. And this has led to derailment all over the world. Uh, and Australia is one of those countries that has suffered most because, as you know, it is very easy to increase the weight of the trains, the speed of the trains, and the length of the trains, but it's not so easy to improve the ground conditions. So because of this mismatch, we have these problems. So before I start at the outset, I would like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Shashika Atapattu, the Hitsamatsu medalist from Asian Institute of Technology, who is now one of my PhD students. Thanks to Jeff Chow for sending him to me. Uh, Professor Cholachat Trujikiat Kamjom, another AIT alumni, 
who is professor of geotechnical engineering at UTS, one of my colleagues and also one of my past PhD students. Uh, Dr. Joseph Arivigalan, a PhD student who recently completed, and Dr. Nijing, another PhD student of mine who is now an associate professor at Shanghai University of Science and Technology. The contents of my presentation, I will give a brief background to mud pumping and why this soil becomes unstable. I will give you some significant developments on the laboratory studies on subgrade soils and why these soils suddenly become a fluid with no real warning. And how prefabricated vertical drains and geotextiles can be used to either delay or prevent the occurrence of mud pumping and application to a case study to show that what I'm actually talking about in terms of principles and concepts, they do actually work in practice. What you see from these pictures here, just to fill my slide, they are showing some large-scale equipment. These are the geotechnical laboratories at University of Technology, Sydney, and I'm proud to say that these are by far the best geotechnical laboratories in Australia at the moment. Why do soils behave in a funny way, especially under cyclic loading with heavy haul trains creating the biggest problem? Well, if you look at some of these slides, thanks to Australian Rail Track Corporation for permitting me to show you these slides, this is what happened to Australian railways after extremely heavy rainfall with flooding and oversaturation. You could see that apart from the railways being eroded underneath the track, the soil conditions are not stable. What happens is that even if you rebuild these tracks, the subgrade soil remains saturated. It is very difficult to unsaturate a soil when it has been for several weeks under flooded conditions. And even if you build this track, and if the trains start operating too quickly, the chances are that the soil will become a fluid and mud pumping will occur. So if you were to see the next picture here, that's a photo that I've taken myself not too far away from the city of Wollongong. You will see that the eastern coast of Australia, which is practically soft, undrained clays that we have in, along the eastern coast, all the way from Brisbane via Sydney, all the way down to Melbourne, we have a lot of soft, undrained, saturated clays uh, along the coast. And you can see that picture where mud pumping has occurred. You can hardly see the ballast because the ballast is totally clogged with the soil that has pumped up. And if you were to dig just underneath a concrete sleeper, you will find a cavity. So practically, these are floating sleepers. And the railway drivers don't know this they will operate the trains until a derailment occurs, and then the Supreme Court judges will go on and on finding out what actually happens. Now, that's really the state of the problem when these things do happen. At the end of the day, of course, the engineers will always get the blame. Somebody has to be the scapegoat, and somebody will be at fault. So the engineers need to watch out. And I think yesterday when we asked the uh, the three musketeers, if I have to say, about advice to the young engineers. I remember, I think, Professor Brand uh, and uh, Professor Nelson saying, well, A, learn from those who know, work with those who know and learn from them, and work hard and understand the soil problems. That's exactly what's required. It doesn't matter how powerful your DEM models are or how powerful your finite element models are. If you don't understand the soil properties, you do garbage and you get garbage out. So you will find that I will show you some distinct element models done by PhD students. But before these models were developed, these students had to understand exactly why the soil suddenly becomes a liquid after the train goes over the soil. This has never happened so many so many years ago, for example, I came to Australia in 1991. I never heard of mud pumping. This mud pumping was first heard in Australia after about 2010, when Australia started to double the loads of the trains 
and some of our heavy water trains are 4 kilometers long. The Guinness Book of World Records will tell you that the longest train in the world is in Western Australia, it's 7 kilometers long. So if you get caught to a train like that at the boom gate, you can switch your car off and read the newspaper. That's the only case. So under these conditions, the soil will become fluid. So I will run this carefully. I will run the first picture first. Let me just see that I can find my mouse. Okay, now if you see the left-hand side picture, you will see the clay becoming a fluid under cyclic loading. But the hydraulic gradient is only about 200 kPa. The hydraulic gradient of the subgrade is not large enough for the soil to come to the top surface. So this is very dangerous because a train driver cannot now see that there is mud, liquefied mud, under the banks. So the train will continue to go. Now just imagine a heavy haul train or a freight train creating this problem of mud pumping and then after 10 minutes a full passenger train comes on the same track it will derail extremely dangerous because in countries like Australia the network is shared by both freight trains and the commuter or the passenger trains now in the second one I have doubled the hydraulic gradient and let's see what happened to this soil the soil will come to the top and therefore you will get the conditions that you see on the right hand side picture at least in that particular case the train drivers can see at a distance that the ballast is covered with mud the train will try to slow down and more importantly can send the signal to the control section don't send any more trains on this track because there is mud okay so this is a discrete element model that actually shows how clay can be fluidized. I think in one of the ground improvement sessions this morning, a question was raised, can DEA be applied for clay soils? Yes, DEA can be applied for clay soils because naturally the clay occurs as floppy level. So therefore, it's not clay -free anymore. Just like you apply for sand, clusters of floppy level clay, you can actually apply that condition for clay soils. So if I were to run the second one here, what I'm going to show here is how the velocity of the clay pumping and the hydraulic gradients increase with the movement of a train. Now let's imagine a 4 kilometer train, 32 ton axle loads, it's too heavy, applying a pressure of up to 400 kPa below the ballast and that is going to occur for the next 20 minutes, because that's the time that the train will take to cross, going at 6 to 80 kilometers per hour. You will show on the right hand side graphs how the inlet fluid pressure gradient and the velocity changes with the cyclic loading. At the beginning, you will see nothing, but suddenly you will find that the clay suddenly becomes a fluid and start pumping upward. So let's try to run this. You can see the hydraulic gradient increasing. You can see the discharge velocity slightly increasing. The clay is just becoming a fluid, and now you can see it pumping up. So this is a discrete element model coupled with computational fluid dynamics. So it is not only soil mechanics that come into the picture. It is the non-linear, non-Darcian flows that you need to couple when you are using the discrete element method. So this is just a simulation of the phenomenon of mud pumping. So in order to simulate this condition in the laboratory, we invented the dynamic soil fluidization apparatus that you can see here in this picture. What this equipment does, it's got a dynamic actuator which is specially designed. Uh, I'm afraid I can see the uh, cursor here, but I can't see that. Uh, on the picture, so I might as well use this. So that's the dynamic actuator. This will apply the load, the dynamic load from a heavy freight train that you can see from here, and then you can see the axial strain increasing like that. So that's a cyclic loading, and the bottom picture will show you the excess pore water pressure that is developed. 
uh, in the green color, what you see is a passenger train that is going at a higher speed, but doesn't develop the pore pressures that much. The brown graph here is one hertz frequency. That is a slower heavy haul train, very heavy train, going at a slower speed. And you can see that the pore pressures develop much higher than this passenger train here. So the time will come if the, the applied loading time is long enough, these pore pressures will increase to an extent where the effective stresses of the subgrade soil will become quite small. Now, what is the mechanism of this mud pumping? I mean, before I talk about the use of geosynthetics and vertical drains, what is the actual mechanism? And if you can look at the way that this equipment monitors every layer of the soil, the, the soil sample is divided here in, in, into several layers. Under cyclic loading, the fine soil fraction segregates from the soil matrix, and it travels, migrates from the bottom to the top. And when the fine fraction of the soil migrates from bottom to the top, it carries moisture with it. Why? Fine particles have a higher specific surface. So if you have a higher specific surface, it carries moisture with it. So what happens to the water content? Well, the water content at the top of the sample will increase, while the water content at the bottom of the samples will decrease. So what happens is the bottom of the sample will undergo consolidation because it's losing the moisture, whereas the top of the sample will increase its water content and start to swell. What happens if this increased water content comes close to the liquid limit? Well, by definition, the soil will become afraid. So that's the mechanism that you have. And as you can see from these different layers, the top layer here has a increased pore pressure gradient, whereas the soil layers here in the middle, they will have a smaller pore pressure gradient. So if the pore pressure gradient is higher, that means you've got a higher water content with the soil that is migrating to the top. So here is another picture to show here of the water content change with the depth of the sample. You can see from this line here that if we had the initial conditions, the liquid limit is here, and if we have a surface geotextile put in there at the top surface, the geotextile will actually reduce the pore pressures, and as a result, the soil with depth will give you these profiles here. It will actually prevent the soil going towards the liquid limit. So the idea of the geotextile here is to dissipate the pore pressures and therefore reduce the negativity or the adversities of the excess pore water pressure gradient and limit the water content and preventing it becoming closer to the liquid limit. You can see that from these measurements here. You can see the pore water pressures plotted on the vertical axis against the number of cycles. If you don't have the geosynthetic at the top, if you don't have the drainage geotextile at the top, you can see that the pore pressures are quite high, irrespective of the depth of the sample. But as soon as you have a geotextile on the top, you will see that the excess pore pressures come significantly down. And with the number of cycles, the pore pressure dissipation will occur, and this will prevent the incidence of mud pumping. So here is another picture to show where the piezometers are located. In this particular case, we are coupling a prefabricated vertical drain, or a PVD, with the geosynthetics. Oops, sorry. So that is the geotextile, and that's the PVD. And P1 to P6, these are the piezometers that you have in this equipment. If you were to look at the P1, which is benefiting most from the PVD as well as the geotextile, because that is the closest to both these, then you will find that the P1 has the lowest pore pressure, which is expected, because that is right here. But if you were to take something like P6, which is further away from the geotextile and also away from the PVD, then P6 will have a much higher pore pressure. So this shows that by using a combination of a top geotextile 
and a short PVD underneath the railway track, you can actually prevent the pore pressure gradients and therefore the chances of mud pumping will be less. So here is an experimental procedure for this. The samples are taken from the ground where there has been a pore, uh, mud pumping history. So this is just uh, in the vicinity of Sydney City. The, you can see the soil has been dug out. A pit has to be made and then undisturbed soil samples will be taken. So this is an undisturbed soil sample taken from the field. And then the ground conditions have to be simulated, K0 of 0.6 typically, confining pressures between 15 to 25 kPa, which are typical of shallow ground conditions. So the confining pressures are not very high on a railway track because it's very close to the surface. And the range of cyclic stress ratios from 0.2 to 1.0, which are typical of low values are for passenger trains. 0.2 to 0.3 will be passenger train. Anything above 0.4 will be heavy haul trains. And then the range of loading frequency, 1 to 5. So 1 will be the frequency typically that is applied from a uh, uh, passenger train. And 5 hertz, uh, sorry, the other way around. 1 hertz will be low velocity for a heavy haul train. And 5 hertz is typical for the speed of uh, passenger train. So all these conditions are modeled in the triaxial testing. As you can see from this figure here, that's the cyclic loading that is applied under these anisotropic state conditions. So what happens? You can see immediately from the left-hand side picture what I just said. Fine particles go from bottom to the top under cyclic loading, and as a result, bottom of the sample consolidates, the top of the sample increases the water content and starts swelling, and Failure takes place, as you can see from here. The cyclic triaxial equipment cannot withstand the load, so the deviative stresses come down with time. And if you take the sample out, you can see one of my PhD students taken the sample out. You can see the fluidized soil right on the top here. That's a much better picture of the same thing. You can see consolidation at the bottom, swelling and fluidization taking place with a slurry-like state right on top of the sample here. So in order to explain this phenomenon in simple soil mechanics, you can plot here horizontally the sample depth. So you can see the top of the sample and the bottom of the sample plotted here in this way. And the liquidity index is plotted on the vertical axis. So those of you who can't remember, the liquidity index is the water content minus the plastic limit divided by the plastic index. And the plastic index is the uh, liquid limit minus the plastic limit. So once the cyclic loading takes place, at the bottom of the sample, you will see that there is consolidation and there is a reduction of the water content because that is the original water content line here. And you can see there is a reduction, so the water content is decreased. As you go towards the top, the water content increases. So, if there is a stable soil sample, that increase in water content from the bottom to the top is quite gradual. And that maximum water content does not give you the liquidity index of one. But in an unstable sample, where the fine fraction takes too much moisture from bottom to the top, the water content will become closer to the plastic limit. Sorry, water content will become closer to the limit. And if that is equal to Pele, then that ratio will become 1. So that's the liquidity index becoming 1, and that soil will therefore become a liquid. So in simple soil mechanics, the simple classification using liquidity index can easily explain. You don't need complicated finite elements for this. Simple soil mechanics, if you can prevent the water content approaching the liquid limit, that's all you need to do to prevent mud pumping. And that's what it does based on the use of geosynthetics. OK, so that's the concept. If you were to look at the particle size distribution, particle size distribution curves, you will see the same story. The top of the sample will have a larger fine fraction. Bottom of the sample will have a lower fine fraction. That means the fine fraction has gone from the bottom to the top, so you get this change of the particle size distribution 
from the right to the left. So the change in gradation justifies what I've just explained there. In terms of the axial strains in a cyclic triaxial equipment, two things need to be looked at in terms of identifying the phenomenon of mud pumping. The axial strains will take off rapidly under a critical cyclic stress ratio. So the cyclic stress ratio is the deviator stress divided by two times the confining pressure. So you can see that these samples, the axial strains suddenly start increasing, whereas for stable soils, the axial strains will become relatively constant. But of course, that is not enough to create fluid, uh, fluidization because you can get undrained failure without having to fluidize. So not all samples fluidize because some samples will, frain, will fail in undrained yielding without fluidizing. I mean, that's what happens in most triaxial testing. But in order to look at fluidization, you have to also look at the change of the pore pressures. If the pore pressures keep on going up, as you can see from here, then coupled with that increased axial strain, you can actually predict the occurrence of mud pumping. I have not shown you all the graphs here, but you can refer to the Canadian Geotechnical Journal, which won the Quigley Award. You can look at that paper, and in Australian conditions, cyclic stress ratios exceeding 0.4 is quite critical, and these are the soils that are vulnerable for mud pumping. For different countries, the CSR values might be different. But we'll have a look at that a little bit later with soils taken from the rest of the world. So here is a summary that I would like you to remember. Those of you who are PhD students here, please remember, if you are going to look at soil fluidization, you need to know two things. How does the excess pore pressure vary? How does the axial strain vary? Axial strain is related to the settlement of your structure. So here it is, unstable soils, pore pressures continue to increase, and that's mud pumping. That should be in corroboration with the axial strain increase, as you can see here, unstable, and bang, you get mud pumping. Stable soils will have constant pore pressure after a certain number of cycles, and also the axial strains will be relatively constant. So these are stable soils, these are the unstable soils. And also these graphs show the effect of the plasticity index. If the soil has a lot of clay, plasticity index will be very high. Because of the cohesion that is provided by the clay, that soil will resist fluidization. So the soils that are most vulnerable to fluidization are the silty, sandy soils which lack cohesion because the fine particles can very quickly segregate under cyclic loading and carry the water content to the top. If you have a lot of clay, like plastic index greater than 50, that soil will be difficult to become a fluid because the clay cohesion holds the matrix or the fabric of the soil together. So I have put all of these things into one chart, so many different studies taken from literature, from different countries, from India, from South Asia, Southeast Asia, and then from Australia here. And something that is very important to see is that when you plot the A-line on the Casa Grande chart, you will see that the soils that are vulnerable to fluidization, at least the ones reported in literature, will have a liquid limit less than 50, and a plasticity index less than 30. In Australian condition, the liquid limit will be less than 40, and the plasticity index will be less than 20, as you can see from the open symbols here. These are from other countries. These are the state of New South Wales soils. So by plotting your soil on a Casa Grande chart, you can actually get a good idea whether your soil needs to be checked in detail for the possibility of mud pumping. So now the use of vertical drains in triaxial equipment. These are large triaxial equipment that are being going to be used. And you can see the vertical drain PVD put in the middle, installed in the middle, and subjected to cyclic stress ratio. And the mean excess pore water pressure is plotted here with the number of cycles. And the soils that are vulnerable for mud pumping are the ones which have the pore pressure gradients increasing rapidly, 
But when you have the vertical drains, the same soils dissipate the pore pressure and become very stable. So this graph shows how the vertical drains can prevent mud pumping, especially if the critical cyclic stress ratio is greater than about 0.4. So as I said earlier, in Australian conditions, if the critical cyclic stress ratio is less than about 0.3, we don't really worry about it. But if the cyclic stress ratio greater than 0.4, which is really for very heavy trains, then we need to do the soil testing to ensure that the soil is not going to mud pump, or it can be vulnerable to mud pumping. So here are some further tests. You can see the large-scale triaxial testing equipment. These are samples, 500 millimeters diameter, one meter high. And you can see when there is no vertical drain, the excess pore pressure rapidly increases to cause failure and fluidization. But once the PVDs are in place, the, the transducers will show that the pore pressures will come to a constant level. And then you will not have the problem of mud pumping. So the next slide shows the application to a real case study. This is a town called Sandgate, which gets flooded all the time. You can see the railway track water everywhere. So of course, the train will not operate under these conditions. But when the flood waters recede, within two days, the trains will start operating again. They really shouldn't be, because the soil is still saturated. So here is a finite element analysis with the vertical drains. So when I know Dr. Brand is going to ask me the question later, Buddhima, did you do the analysis before the event or after the event? And the answer is, this is class A prediction. Uh, the Australian Rail Track Corporation asked me to design this track because of mud pumping for the last five, six years, and so on. So uh, the, this particular case, uh, I didn't have the field data. I only knew that the mud pumping was taken place. So we did the design of the track 30 meters of estuary in place, but we used only vertical drains six to eight meters deep because you don't need to stabilize 30 meters of clay. To the pore pressures will be much less. You can see that here the pore pressures come down dramatically when you have the vertical drains. The left hand lower graph shows the settlements and you can see that the prediction, class A prediction is given by the solid line and the data was given by the Australian Railway Track Corporation one and a half years later after the design and the construction was done. And you can see that the predictions are pretty good. So this is a class A prediction, and the analysis was done before the event. And on the right-hand side, it shows the lateral movements. The lateral movement of the clay would be substantial at 45 millimeters close to the surface, and that is when the mud pumping was taken place. With the vertical drains, because of isotropic compression that is encouraged by the vertical drains, the lateral movements were significantly reduced, as you can see from the red line, which is the prediction. And these are the field data that was provided one and a half years later, once the field measurements were. Again, for all practical reasons, that's a pretty good prediction for a track like this. And for the last eight years since this design, there have not been a single incident of mud pumping on this track. So the vertical drains did work. Now, Sydney trains have adopted this concept, and thank to the industry that uh, they have adopted. Railways are very conservative in every country. They don't want change. But in this particular case, they have no choice. Because mud pumping occurs in Sydney areas. You can see how wet the clay is when you excavate a track that is non-functional. You can see the amount of water in the excavation. This is the water from the previous rainfall and seepage. Just imagine 32 ton axle trains going on soil with so much water underneath. So you can see the geotextiles being put on. And now I will introduce another concept very quickly. I didn't ex uh, explain this in detail. One of the reasons for mud pumping can also be explained using energy. If you have a 70,000 ton train with 365 carriages going at 80 kilometers power, you can calculate the kinetic energy, half mv squared. It's a massive amount of energy that is put into the ground. But if you can trap this energy by designing an energy reservoir, then 
there is less energy transfer to the soil. If there is less energy transfer to the soil, then the incidence of mud pumping can be reduced. Now what we do is, we take discarded rubber tires. Australia produces two times our population rubber tires every year. 50 million rubber tires are being discarded every year in Australia. Plenty of rubber tires, take them, fill them up with waste materials like coal wash coming from coal mines, and then build the track on these infill rubber tires. Another one to do is take conveyor belts that have been discarded from mines, use water jet cutting, and make geogrids made of recycled rubber. So these are not normal geogrids, these are recycled geogrids manufactured in the workshop at University of Technology Sydney. We take conveyor belts, discarded conveyor belts, make the apertures, and make these, and then build the railway track on top of that. So what these recycled rubber mats and rubber tires do, they retain the energy, act like energy reservoir. As a result, there is less energy transferred to the soil and therefore creates less incidence of mud pumping. So coming to the conclusions, uh, something very important is that the plastic index has to be less than about 30 before the soils can become mud pumping. If you have too much clay, then the PI will be too high, you will not get mud pumping. So first thing to look at is whether your soil has a PI, plastic index, less than 30. The next step is to look at what the hydraulic gradients are. What is the chance that your water content can become close to the liquid limit or the liquidity index can become close to one? If the cyclic stress ratio is greater than 0.4, then there is a good chance that particular soil can become subject to mud pumping if the plastic index is less than 30. And that we need to look at. And finally, using short PVDs and geotextile, as you can see from the previous slide, then the incidence of mud pumping can be prevented. I would like to conclude my presentation by acknowledging the Australian Research Council for grants over the past decade that made it possible to study this phenomenon of mud pumping and the use of geosynthetics. The PhD students and research associates at the UTS, Transport Research Center, and of course the industry partners, so many to mention, who have not let us just use this theory and use publications just filling the shelves in a library, but they have actually adopted these and put them into practice. So I would like to end by, and you can see the pictures of the fantastic PhD students and the researchers that we have at the University of Technology Sydney Transport Research Center. Thank you so much. Thank you, very, thank you very much again for a superb keynote. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Prof. Very interesting uh, solution. Um, my question is about the PBD. So I, I got two questions actually. The first question is, uh, what's the basis of your PVD design? Because normally we design to a full, con say 90% uh, of consolidation sediment, for, for example. And the second question will be more to the actual project's sequence. Because when you install PVD at the, the surface, you created a, a drain conditions. So before you backfill with ballast, do you actually need to surcharge that, that uh, layer? Yeah, okay. thanks. You wouldn't have asked that question if I had shown you some of the slides that is after my conclusions, but because of the brevity of time, I couldn't show that. That's a very good question. No, the railways are not going to let you preload for nine months. They will lose $1 million per hour on productivity. You are talking about uh, trains that are carrying iron ore, gold or silver or copper and all that. So they don't have that patience. So the preloading is done by trains. So at the beginning, because you are going to get settlements because of PBD, you're absolutely right, the trains have to go at 25 kilometers per hour. So the trains are the preloading. And when the settlement curves come to a plateau, you increase the speed slowly. So I had to advise them when to have the trains at 40 kilometers hour, when to have it at 60, and when the settlement curves come to a plateau, then you can go for your full speed 80 kilometers per hour. So the preloading was done by trains operating at very low speeds. That answers your question? 
they are no because the pvds are very short the settlements will come to a plateau very quickly because as i said you are not going to put vertical drains to 20 meters depth here only about 6 meters so the settlements will be quite quick okay Unfortunately, uh, I think we are running out of time. So if you still have questions, maybe during the break, you can okay. ask the Professor Putima. So please join, join me in uh, giving another round of applause to Professor Putima. Thank you very much. And as a token of appreciation, please remain on stage. Yeah. I'd like to invite Professor Sutisak uh, to give a small gift as a token of appreciation. Thank you very much, professors. So with that, I would like to end our keynote session today. Thank you.